and progress we are making progress uh as i said that i wanted to implement i've created this timer class it is a very simple class you can create it and it starts counting time in second and then you can get it anytime you want and then you can reset to start counting again or set to a given um, initial time so it's a very simple class implementation is also simple i'm using std chrono i really dislike this but it is what it is and it will do the trick um and it counts in milliseconds internally and then when you get it you can it converts this to seconds okay just to have some extra precision um this is a very handy function very handy class i have it in all my engines and it really helps and then i've implemented the clock function as well the clock class and this class is actually let me show you inspired by pygame as a lot of things in this in this library that i'm working specifically pygame time dot clock pygame does have this clock um class that does have a tick that updates the clock and you can pass a parameter for the frame rate and it will wait to make sure that the, your game loop runs at that frames per second so it is very handy and also handles delta time and so on so i've implemented that right here simple clock i can create this like so on my this is my test main file so it's crazy as you probably already know and then i can simply take this giving a target frames per second such as 60. uh there's there are two things to keep in mind here the first one is i do have vsync enable um and i've even created like a enable and disable vsync it this is uh, important to keep in mind because for example my monitor is 60 hertz so no matter what if vsync vsync is enabled it will not gonna go beyond 60 frames per second so this is important to know and the other thing is i'm really bad with std chrono and time in general because the other option other than std chrono is c the, the C style time dot H, which is very bad. And the last option, which is probably like the optimal option is to create this for each platform, just like we did with the events and the window and so on to have like windows specific stuff, the Linux specific, then them script them. And I really do not want to do that. I wanted to keep things simple because I, re I will already I have to deal with events and windows mainly so i don't want to have to deal with time as well so that's why i'm internally using chrono and my implementation is a little bit uh chaotic at the moment so it is not very precise it usually um, if you put like 30 frames per second it will usually run at like 40 frames and this is a bit bad um, but anyways it will do the trick especially because we do have um vsync so that's fine and i'm calling this done for now and just for the sake of my sanity i've added the precision boolean which is disabled by by default and if you enable this it you literally just spin your cpu cycles as fast as possible until it reaches the time which is again not good but it's an option if you want to do this if you want to use this library for that you can do it uh, otherwise it will sleep and again as i said it may or may not have like the perfect synchrony it's like around this frame time it's not guaranteed due to many reasons okay i tried my best to improve this but it's hard and uh when it when it comes to game engine development the, it's very important that you know that you understand uh, when to keep moving forward towards a solution to a problem and when to not keep moving forward and just accept like a, an average result and this is the case especially because again most monitors do have a 60 hertz and i i'm fine with having 60 hertz uh vsync enable and if you don't have vsync enable and you still want to limit the fps i mean actually if you don't have vsync enable you probably don't want to limit the fps so you can pass 
zero to the FPS and it's not gonna do that. It will just update the delta time if you pass zero. Um, so that's fine. But if you want VSync disable but still limit the, the FPS just in case someone have like an 144 hertz monitor or something like that, um, you will get like around 60 uh, limited. So that's fine, uh, I guess, especially with the delta time. Okay, so yeah, that's it. Lot I've complicated a lot my conversation here just to say that it may or may not work very well. But something else that I want to talk is the rolling buffer. This is a very simple technique. Um, I wanted to calculate the frames per second, and the way I do this is I store the le the last ten frames delta time, and then I add them together right here, and then I divide the by the amount of frames to get an average, you know. Then I do some math here in double, and then I cast the float, but just to get like an average delta time for the last frames, and then I use that to calculate the frames per second because frames per second tend to fluctuate a lot between each individual frame. So what we usually want to do is to store a bunch of frames and then take the average. So this is what I'm doing. And a rolling buffer is actually a very common technique uh, in game development that you basically have an array with a fixed size. In this case, I have 10. I can increase this to 60 to store like 60 frames. It's fine, but 10 is okay. Um, and then I have like an access ID. In this case, I'm having this delta ID equals to zero. And every time I want to access this to add a new element, I basically increment the ID as I'm seeing, uh, as you can see that I'm doing right here. And then I take the mod of the size of the rolling buffer. What this means is that this delta is here. Every time I write to them, so this is the like the list. Let me just put a dot, put a bunch of zeros. So this is the last deltas, for example. And then if I access it once, it will go here, and then here, 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 and then here. And once it reaches the end, since I'm taking the module here, it will go back to the first and keep going and going and going forever. So very simple thing, and it really helps if you want to do something like that. So this is a technique very common game uh, development. So that's it. Uh, I did some other stuff. For example, I have this convert Y to normal string and I also have the game path, which is OS dependent. So it is implemented here with Windows. It's fine to do this, get module name, file name. It's easy to do. Um, but yes, I've implemented that. This is very important. Also, I did some fixing and believe it or not, let me clean the solution and build it again. I managed to fix all the warnings which is something that i never do but i decided to do it for this time of course we do have warning level w3 um it definitely does not work with wall which is all the warnings it will spend thousands of warnings anyways and most of them are not even my fault it's like the third party stb and so on so but yeah when it comes to my code you can see here it is fixed it, it does not have any warnings so it's fine and I ended up finding a bug. Let me try to show you the bug here. Um, it is in the image. You can see that I ended up finding a bug here. I was actually comparing the pixelated with the value you pass uh, to this function instead of assigning. So this is something that the compiler will compile. It will not gonna raise an error, but it will raise a warning saying, hey, this is probably not right. And it was not, and I was not paying attention. So this is why I like to review the code and fix some stuff. It's always good because you end up fixing bugs <laughs> inevitably, right? Now, one last thing that I wanna do in this video is to take some time to see how many lines of code we wrote until now because we do have a lot of stuff going on already and this library like we are not using mm, a lot of third-party libraries we are still using a lot of a lot of third-party libraries but you, you got the point so many people get curious about how many lines of code so i'm here with a linux uh wssl it's hard to pronounce but i have a cool program called clock that basically count lines of code. And then you can pass a directory, for example, the editor. The editor does not have a lot of lines of code. 
and it will count for you. So we have one file and 102 lines of code. And what is interesting about clock is that it does not consider, like it separates the commented out code and the blank code. For example, you can see that I actually have 164 lines of code in the editor, but it is counting 102 and say I have 40 lines blank and 22 comments. So that's good. Now let's see the engine. Guess how many lines of code does have? And it turns out that it does have 2,447 lines of code, or 2,400. Um, it's, it's a good number, honestly. Uh, it does have um, 1,800 lines of C++ implementation and 640 lines of header files. 38 files in total and it does have a lot of blank lines and some comments but this is the rate and let's see how this evolves as we move forward right so this is the total amount of lines of code around 2500 uh, if you zoom then zoom those two numbers so this is it uh, let's see in maybe five or ten videos how this will evolve uh, but we are pretty pretty much done. Now it's a good place to start writing the physics and then the very specific game engine architecture such as game objects and seeing ref. So that's it for this video folks. Hope you enjoy and I see you in the next one. Bye.